Okay, thank you very much. I am not Council Member Darlene Mealy, Chair Dar Darlene Mealy. I am Council Member Daniel Drum, but she's on her way up, and uh, we wanted to get started. And uh, let me just begin by reading this statement. Today, the Committee on Civil Rights will vote on introductory bill number 1259A, an important piece of legislation that will help protect our veterans from discrimination by giving them protected status in New York City human rights law. I hope that my fellow committee members will support this bill today so we can vote on it at Wednesday's stated meeting. Thank you again for making the time to vote on such important legislation. I will now turn it over to Councilmember Williams, who sponsored intro 1259A for some brief remarks. Councilmember Williams. Thank you, uh, Councilmember. Uh, 1259 was uh, introduced by myself, and Public Advocate Tish James was a co-prime sponsor with support from the administration. The bill gives veterans and active military members direct protections under city law against discrimination, housing, employment, and public accommodations. Veterans and uniformed service members provide valuable contributions. While their patriotism solicits respect from us, it also at times makes them some of the most vulnerable members of our society. It is our duty as Americans and legislators to protect them, provide them with support, and make sure that the promises that were given to them are being made. And I say that irrespective of uh, support for the wars uh, that most of them I don't concur with, uh, don't agree with. Uh, however, we gave promises to these men and women uh, who go and risk their lives. They should be honored when they come back home. New York State is home to nearly 900,000 veterans, 225,000 of whom call New York City home. Um, they have had issues with finding stable employment uh, and housing because of their uh, being active duty, in particular reserves, or people sometimes afraid of PTSD. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, nearly 14,000 veterans are unemployed across New York State, according to the Borough, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Employers refuse to hire them, as I mentioned, fear they will be deployed during employment or falsely assume veterans may suffer from he mental health illnesses. Approximately 2,500 homeless veterans uh, across New York State. We continually hold up our veterans and uniform services as valuable protectors, yet we routinely leave them vulnerable and undefended even as they fulfill their end of the agreement. I believe it's our duty to pass this legislation, uh, of course, on behalf of all veterans, in particular uh, many of my family members who are active or uh, veterans themselves, including my brother Matthew Williams, who this summer will be going off to the United States Navy. Uh, I want to thank everybody who was supportive, and including uh, Chair Mealy, also um, Chair Ulrich of the Veterans Committee, uh, Brigadier General Sutton, and Commissioner um, Malalas uh, for their support, and of course Christine Rouse from the New York City Veterans Alliance. Thank you. Thank you very much, and now to Council Member Eric Ulrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. I'm a guest at today's committee, so I just wanted to stop by and commend my colleague, uh, uh, Jamani Williams, and also the public advocate for introducing the bill, which the committee will be hopefully approving today. Uh, we had a joint oversight hearing on uh, uh, about a month, um, I'm sorry, two months ago, April 26th. We had a joint oversight hearing on this very topic. It's very important. Uh, that we recognize that discrimination in our society comes in many forms and unfortunately there are uh, many former service members who now uh, are no longer active in the military but they're still serving our city in other various capacities and they face discrimination when it comes to housing and uh, employment and in a range of other ways. So uh, while there are a number of civil protections at the federal and state level, there really was a need to beef up the city's uh, human rights law to reflect uh, the contributions that veterans have made and also make sure that they are in fact the protected class. So I'm hoping that it is approved and I want to thank all my colleagues for all their support always on all veterans issues. Uh, it's a bipartisan issue. Democrats and Republicans I think universally agree that we have to do more to support the men and women who've served our country and that's what this is all about. So thank you very much Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, and thank you to both of you for your commitment to human and civil rights, and thank you also for marching in either the Brooklyn and or the Queens Pride Parades. I'm very personally grateful to both of you for doing that, and uh, it's a, it means a, a big deal to our community. Thank you. All right, so um, I want to thank Chair Mealy for hearing this package of bills. Oh, so let me just say also, we're going to hold the vote for a couple of minutes because uh, we need a quorum. As soon as we get the quorum, I will let the uh, members of the committee vote. And then we'll go back to testimony, if that's right. But in the meantime, what I'll do is we'll start and hear testimony from um, our, our panelists. So let me start off by saying I want to thank Chair Mealy for hearing the package of bills concerning lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer issues. 
Even as progress for LGBTQ civil rights advances, members of the community continue to endure adversity simply for being who they are. Resolution 614 would prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender expression or identity in New York State and expand the state's hate crime statute to include such forms of discrimination. Doing so will protect transgender individuals from bias-related harassment and discrimination in employment, housing, and public accommodation, among other areas. In 12, uh, Resolution 1287, <coughs> excuse me, calls on the United States Congress to pass and the President to sign the Long Overdue Equality Act, which would amend the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 68 to include sexual orientation and gender identity as protected classes. Intro 1186 amends the definitions of sexual orientation and gender in the New York City Human Rights Law. It is time to update these terms, especially given how much society's understanding has evolved since protections for the LGBT community were first included. So finally, we're going to hear um, legis uh, hear we're going to um, hear testimony on legislation which prohibits conversion therapy, the odious practice by which mental health and spiritual counselors seek to change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. Conversion therapists are hucksters and scammers who target vulnerable and disparate, desperate individuals struggling to understand their sexual orientation or gender identity. So-called counselors swoop in and claim to offer a way to rid their suffering through pseudotherapy that is harmful and often damaging, and I have to call it nothing more than quackery. Sadly, the practice still persists. Even in New York, conversion therapy sessions are often bizarre and always damaging. One teenager was told to undress in front of a mirror while his ex-gay life coach stood so close the boy could feel the man's breath on the back of his neck. He was then cuddled by older ex-gay men for 30 minutes at a time to at a time to allegedly reestablish the bond with his father. A group, of, a group session entailed the striking of a tennis racket on a pillow, which was meant to represent his mother, whose overbearing nature had reportedly made him gay. There is no scientific evidence that conversion therapy works. In fact, many so-called ex-gays have been either caught in, how shall I say, compromising positions, or have renounced the practice for the quackery it is. With this introduction, uh, which is a very strong measure against conversion therapy, New York City can take the lead nationally on this issue. I very much look forward to hearing from the administration and the advocates on this issue as well. So thank you all for being here. And let me just introduce those who are on the panel. Dr. Myla Harrison, I believe, Assistant Commissioner from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, Amit Baga, Deputy Commissioner for Department of Consumer Affairs, and Commissioner Carmelin Malalas, New York City Commission on Human Rights. And I just need to swear you all in, so if I could ask you, and we have Matt McMorrow also. Are you testifying, Matt? Just for Q&A. Okay, because then you <coughs> need to fill out a form if, uh, if you do give testimony. Okay, so um, can I ask you all to raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And um, who would like to start, Commissioner? Sure, thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, Council Member Drum and Council Members um, from the, uh, who are members of the Civil Rights Committee. I want to thank you for convening today's hearing on intro number 1186 and a proposed bill to ban conversion therapy. I am Carmelyn P. Malalas. I'm the Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here today to talk about updating the definitions of sexual orientation and gender under the New York City Human Rights Law to ensure that the law's coverage for these two protected categories are broad and inclusive. Uh, and I have to say I'm especially pleased and proud, of course, to be here during Pride Month uh, and to be accompanied by my colleagues from the administration, uh, Myla Harrison from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Amit Baga from the Department of Consumer Affairs and Matt McMorrow uh, from the uh, Community Affairs Unit. We are here to discuss how we can fulfill the promise of city human rights law in as protective a way as possible so that my agency, the Commission on Human Rights, can carry out its mission to make sure that all New Yorkers can live, work, and be free from discrimination and harassment. This issue is personally and professionally very important to me. 
As a lesbian, I'm a loud and proud member of the New York City's diverse and beautiful LGBT community. And as an attorney, I spent over a decade as a workers' rights advocate representing employees in discrimination cases based on sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, and many other areas of protection. Protections against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation were added to the law in 1986. Local Law 2 defines sexual orientation as heterosexuality, homosexuality, or bisexuality. Protections against gender identity and expression have existed in the New York City Human Rights Law since 2002, when the definition of gender was amended to include actual or perceived sex and shall also include a person's gender identity, self-image, appearance, behavior, or expression, whether or not that gender identity, self-image, appearance, behavior, or expression is different from that traditionally associated with the legal sex assigned to that person at birth. In the nearly two and a half years that I've been at the helm of the Commission on Human Rights, we have worked diligently to be transparent about policy, increase outreach, and strengthen enforcement in these key areas of protection. In December 2015, the Commission published its legal enforcement guidance on discrimination on the basis of gender identity or expression to provide clear guidance to business owners, employers, housing providers, and members of the public on what exactly is considered discrimination on the basis of gender identity and expression under the city human rights law, and how such discrimination works to marginalize transgender and gender nonconforming people. The legal enforcement guidance specifically articulates violations of the city human rights law, which include denying someone access to the single sex facility, such as a bathroom or locker room, or program that aligns with their gender identity, refusing to use someone's preferred name or pronoun, requiring dress codes or uniforms, or applying groomer or appearance standards that impose different requirements for individuals based on sex or gender, or forcing a transgender or gender nonconforming individual to use a single occupant facility. It is our goal in creating the guidance to provide needed transparency and clarity to all New Yorkers on their rights and obligations under the city human rights law. And last year, we also launched our citywide award-winning campaign, Look Past Pink and Blue, featuring real New Yorkers to educate New Yorkers on their rights regarding access to single-sex facilities. The Commission now has a long-standing partnership with the LGBT Community Center, who I see is also represented here today, to provide training to employers, city, state, and federal agencies, housing providers, and others on transgender cultural competency. And last year, the Commission worked with local community partners to organize the city's first ever Transgender Week of Remembrance and Resilience expanding it from one day into an entire week of activities and events. Our Law Enforcement Bureau has also stepped up enforcement to protect transgender and gender nonconforming New Yorkers. Claims of discrimination based on gender identity or expression continued to rise in 2016, following a two-year trend. In 2014, only one such case was filed at the Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau. In 2015, 18 cases were filed, and in 2016, 29 cases were filed, including three commission-initiated complaints in the employment context across all jurisdictional areas. In addition, the Law Enforcement Bureau conducted 47 commission-initiated investigations into gender identity and expression uh, by providers of housing and public accommodations, using testing and document demands for information on policies and practices. Similarly, in 2016, the Commission filed 49 complaints of discrimination based on sexual orientation, building on a two-year trend of increased complaints, which was up from 30 in 2014. We are up more than 60% in complaints from 2014 to 2016 in sexual orientation and 60% in gender identity or expression from 2015 to 2016. And let me be clear, these are numbers of complaints filed not inquiries, matters resolved through pre-complaint intervention or pre-complaint investigations. We strongly support the goals of this legislation as it furthers our shared mission to ensure that the city human rights laws protections are comprehensive and inclusive. The Commission, along with our partners in the administration, are reviewing the language proposed in Intro 1186 and are exploring additional options based on language used in other jurisdictions feedback from community partners, and our own internal analysis. 
We have already initiated conversation with Council Member Drum's office to consult on some of these changes and we will continue to do so. We look forward to working closely with the Council to ensure that the updated definitions reflect our intent to protect people on the basis of their sexuality and their gender identity. I also wish to comment briefly on the proposed legislation to crack down on conversion therapy. The Commission supports efforts to ban this offensive and inhumane practice, and we are eager to explore ways in which we can work with our administration and council partners to tackle this problem. Again, we thank Council Member Drum for introducing intro number 1186, and we look forward to working with you, the council, and our partners in the administration to ensure that protections based on sexual orientation and, and gender are inclusive of the full scope of sexualities and gender identities to further our shared goal of dignity and respect for all. And I'd also like to just welcome and say hi to Chair Mealy. Thank you. Um, Health Department. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Mealy and Council Member Drum and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Myla Harrison, Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Mental Health at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I want to reiterate today the department's strong opposition to conversion therapy practices and any attempts to change an individual's sexual orientation. Conversion therapy has no basis in scientific or medical practice, nor is sexual orientation a disease. Conversion therapy is not therapy, and responsible health professionals should not practice it. Indeed, the practice of conversion therapy is already curbed by a number of state mechanisms. In 2016, three New York State agencies enacted regulations to curb the use of conversion therapy in New York State. Per these regulations, mental health facilities licensed, funded, or operated by the State Office of Mental Health are prohibited from practicing conversion therapy on minors and can lose their license or funding for doing so. In addition, Medicaid does not cover conversion therapy for any Medicaid enrollee regardless of age. And insurers cannot cover conversion therapy for minors on any insurance policy offered in New York State. We are glad that the Council has brought attention to the practice of conversion therapy in New York City. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Mr. Baga. Thank you, Council Member Drum. Good afternoon, Chair Mealy and Council Member Drum. I'm Amit Baga, Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, or DCA. It is a great honor and privilege to appear before this body once again on behalf of the agency Commissioner Salas, uh, and of course, Mayor de Blasio. And it's an honor to be here with my colleagues. The topic of today's hearing is of great concern to me personally, and indeed the administration as a whole, which as my colleagues from the Human Rights Commission have noted, has worked hard to ensure that LGBT New Yorkers have access to stronger and more enhanced protections than ever before. We strongly agree with the speaker and with the committee and of course with you, Council Member Drum, that conversion therapy, which is engaged in in an attempt to repress or change the sexual orientations or gender identities of LGBT New Yorkers like me, is an objectionable practice that we believe has no place in our great city. We commend the Council and especially you, Council Member Drum, for your attention to this serious issue as well as for your tremendous leadership on so many LGBTQ issues. Your work to increase access to protections, support, and resources has benefited so many LGBTQ New Yorkers, especially our youth. Given how challenging it can still be despite our many collective advances to go through the coming out process, your leadership on these issues has ensured that young New Yorkers coming to terms with who they are are able to grow and thrive. Turning directly to the topic of today's hearing, I'd like to take a moment to offer the Council some context for my testimony. I sit here before you today as an out gay Indian American who has had the tremendous benefit of great support from friends, colleagues, and most importantly, my family. While the coming out process is not easy for anyone, I am deeply grateful, especially to my parents, who come from a cultural background not necessarily known for its embrace of LGBTQ individuals for accepting my identity and never cajoling, convincing, or coercing me to alter it. Unfortunately, this type of acceptance still remains elusive for many LGBTQ individuals, 
in communities where discomfort or fear of what it means to LG, uh, what it means to be LGBTQ are pervasive. Individuals not only suffer but can also face large amounts of pressure to conceal or change their professed sexual orientations or gender identities. Such pressure can come from families, from friends, colleagues, teachers, and sometimes even from within. This can lead to individuals experiencing trauma or crisis to be forced into or even seek conversion therapy, which, as my colleagues from the health department have testified, is not considered by our administration to be a bona fide medical or mental health service. We know that conversion therapy has the capacity to ruin lives, tear families apart, and further entrench values of fear and exclusion that we do not believe represent the spirit of New York City and its people. As such, we are proud to stand with you in firm opposition to this practice, and we proclaim to you our deep commitment to working closely with you on a potential legislative approach that helps address the practice of such therapy in New York City. With respect to the bill before us today, the overall goal of which we strongly support, it behooves us to state that the law department has identified and is continuing to explore a variety of legal questions pertaining to the bill, and DCA has identified certain concerns with respect to its implementation as well. As you know, the law department reviews legislation to ensure that it passes legal muster. It is our understanding that this review includes the consideration of a number of different legal questions. Once the law department has completed its review of the bill, we would be eager to return to the council with their analysis and to work collectively to identify a path forward on addressing the practice of conversion therapy in New York City. With respect to DCA's implementation concerns, the current language of the bill would require DCA to make a determination about whether or not the practice has actually occurred, as opposed to whether or not it has been advertised or offered for sale. Given that we are an agency not involved in medical or mental health services, unfortunately this is not a determination we are in a position to make. As we, too, share the Council's deep opposition to conversion therapy, we are committed to working closely with you to explore alternative enforcement approaches. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My colleagues and I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. I want to thank you. I want to thank my colleague, Drum, for holding down the fort until I appreciate that. Um, I want to thank the commissioner also. Uh, we're going to open up. Did you have your questions as of yet? Um, and then, we, okay. So we're going to do a vote right now. Salamanca. I don't know. Thank you. Are you going to do it? Uh, committee Clerk Matthew DiStefano, Committee on Civil Rights. Roll call on intro number 1259A, Chair Mealy. I vote aye. Drum. I vote aye. Salamanca. I vote aye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, the item has been adopted. Okay, we will hold that vote open for my other colleagues to come who is on this committee. Thank you. Now I was. Uh, we're going to finish this hearing. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, I loved opening for you. And I uh, love seeing you here as well. So uh, I always appreciate the hearings that you hold. Um, these issues of civil and human rights are ones that are really important to me. So, and I'm also glad to hear that um, the administration in general supports the idea of ridding uh, the practice of conversion therapy. Uh, we may disagree somewhat on, in terms of the implementation or the enforcement of the law, but I do want to get to uh, some questions. Um, so, I mean, um, currently, what is the medical opinion on conversion therapy? So I, don't, I can't speak for the medical opinion as a whole. I can, I can say that the health department strongly opposes conversion therapy practices. I can also say national medical associations, um, many of them, the AMA, the APA, American Psychological Association, American Psychiatric Association, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, all say it is not an acceptable practice. 
They say it's not acceptable. However, they don't say that continued use of it should be um, considered to be fraud. Uh, and I want to compare it, and I, maybe I'm wrong in doing this because I'm not a doctor, but if you had somebody who did a medical procedure on a person uh, that wasn't either necessary or um, uh, there was no basis for it in medical um, uh, terminology, um, would the medical profession then say that that's something either that I think they do actually, that it's illegal and I think you could probably face jail time for doing that? And I've always been curious and, and wondering why do we allow this to continue when it's just outright fraud? I, I, and I think the health department should look at that. So why don't I take that back and have a further conversation with council? Well, I, I think, and I address that issue because um, I don't think that the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, the American Medical Association have ever really fully addressed this issue. Now, we were taken off the list, and I'm also openly gay, council member. We took the homosexuality off the list of mental disorders in 1973, but um, if we had medical malpractice in the physical medical community, I think people would be put in prison. And I don't see any difference between the practice of conversion therapy and that which uh, medical doctors do, physical medical doctors uh, do. So I really would like to bring that issue up and, and, and get an opinion from the health department on that uh, because I think that it really needs to be even stronger than what we've stated uh, so far. Can you describe for us um, what some of the impacts are of conversion therapy on individuals? I haven't researched that and, or prepared for that for this um, presentation. But you knew that we were That's going to have this hearing? hearing? Was about. Yes, but that particular question I don't have I don't have the research in front of me for. We can get back to you if you want more specifics on that. Wow. I really don't understand that. This is such an important information we need right now. And that's why we had this hearing. So I don't know if it's meant to have another hearing that we can understand or you have any background on this information? Uh, I'm happy to get back to you on that further. I mean, I've repeatedly said that the health department d strongly opposes this and that knows that it's um, a practice that's not acceptable and more information than that I don't have at my fingertips for today. Okay, so to your knowledge, are there groups of individuals that practice conversion therapy in New York City? Not that I'm aware of. I don't, I don't um, know. Licensed or unlicensed? I don't have that information. I do not know that. What hearing did you think you were coming to? I mean, we don't keep as the health department information on practices that have that information. There are, there are the state of New York licenses practitioners for medicine and licenses clinics around New York City. So it's a, a, a New York State issue in terms of licenses. Do you know one clinic that still uses this practice? I do not. No, and, and the state of New York has just recently in 2016 um, said that practices cannot licensed mental health practices cannot practice this when it comes to children. They will lose their license, they will lose their funding. Medicaid is not funding it as well, and so it's not a practice that's accepted in New York State. How do you monitor that in New York City? So it's not the city to monitor that, it's a, it's a state issue. It's not a state issue, the city issue as well. Are you saying all medical issues are state issues and that we don't have a right to monitor them? I can't speak for that. I think that's probably a law department question um, and a question for the state of Are you the New assistant York. commissioner? I'm the assistant commissioner of the Mental Health Bureau. Uh, for mental health? Yep. And you don't know the answer to these questions? We don't license in, in New York City. So, but so you've never thought about dealing with conversion therapy issues before? Because you have no answers. We do not think it's an acceptable practice. Yeah, so, so if it's not an acceptable practice, and there are going to be witnesses after this, that are going to describe some of the negative consequences that happen to them, to come to a hearing on conversion therapy without any answers is unacceptable. So it's not true that I don't have any answers. So I, I, I don't mean to be obstructionistic. That's not. No, but your statement is this. 
That's not the and tone. It's so insulting to us for a statement like this. It's not even a sheet. I mean, come on. I mean, I'm not. I don't think I'm being ir un unreasonable here. I'm glad that you condemn it, but what are you doing about it? So in New York City, as you all know, there's a lot of resources that are going to mental health more than ever with Thrive NYC. We have NYC Well, which is a phone, text, and chat service, so people who are in crisis for whatever reason around their mental health issues. Commissioner, you know as well with Thrive NYC, there so is concern in the LGBT community also yes. that you're not meeting the needs of the LGBT community with Thrive. So there are a number of comprehensive efforts that are going on now, both within the health department and with uh, our um, advisory boards. So within the health department, there are um, coordinating groups within the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene that are comprised of individuals across the department who are spending efforts on policy and programming right now so that our efforts are coordinated and interconnected. We have a subcommittee of our community services board that is focused on LGBTQ issues, and they are weighing in on our required social, local services plan so that we can address these issues. So we Will are- Will conversion therapy be part of that discussion? We can consider that. We can bring ha it to Has that, that group committee. met already? That group has met a number of times. Has it had conversion therapy as part of that discussion already? Um, I haven't been at all the meetings. I don't think so, but we can. I can certainly take that back. And uh, there, there are L obviously LGBT people on that? Yes. On that committee? Yes. All right, um, let me move on a little bit. Do you believe that any of the potential penalties as described in the proposed legislation are sufficient to deter those from practicing conversion therapy? Thank you, Councilmember Drum. <clears throat> it's, you know, as an enforcement agency, we do, of course, um, testify before the council very frequently, and, and we have many conversations with the council, with the law department, with others. Um, asking in any context what would be a sufficient penalty to deter any type of particular type of behavior, whatever it is. Um, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, it's not entirely clear that any penalty at any given time would necessarily be sufficient or insufficient. It's the type of thing that I think historically DCA has found we, we learn about uh, the, the degree to which a penalty is sufficient once the law goes into effect. So, so it would be so a, a slightly difficult. The thousand dollars per uh, occurrence. Do you think that's a deterrent? Uh, truthfully, Councilmember Drum, being that we're not an agency, you we're not we're not a medical or mental health services agency. It's difficult for us to say that we have, you know, real knowledge of what the incentive would be for those who engage in conversion therapy to continue to engage in it. Um, it it's not clear. You know, there are, there are different pressures, as you have mentioned in your opening statement. Um, it could be that the pressures of society um, or belief are such that um, even the penalty laid out in the bill could perhaps prove insufficient, or it might be very sufficient. I, I wouldn't be able to opine on that. Um, so you wouldn't be able to opine on it, but we do have other legislation uh, on other topics that lays out sets of fines for um, offenses or for grievances uh, against other consumer affairs issues. Um, how do you determine that within your own department? So um, in nearly every instance, I can't think of one right now off the top of my head where this is not the case, but in nearly every instance, a penalty is almost always determined by the legislative body. Um, we very, very rarely have the legal authority or ability to actually determine the penalty on our own. So that's our decision? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm following on that. All right. So. Um, do you believe that the legislation um, will require a budget for implementation? Um, respectfully, I think it's a bit premature for me to answer that question as the law department is still examining a variety of legal questions with respect to this bill. And I think until they've completed their review, we would not be in a position to be able to opine on the budget. Okay, do, uh, do, do you get any other issues? Um, uh, for example, I know that we passed legislation in the council regarding pregnancy crisis centers, uh, and uh, sometimes determinations have to be made there as to what type of advice is offered in pregnancy crisis centers, yet we passed legislation uh, limiting that and uh, providing for transparency. 
do you see differences between that type of legislation and the legislation regarding conversion therapy? Yes. So <clears throat> while I can get back to you on all of the differences, and I'd be happy to do so and in short order, um, the primary difference that is obvious to me between this bill and that uh, particular law is that what DCA uh, would be looking at in that instance um, is whether or not certain types of signage uh, and disclosures are being made and cert signage is posted at a given pregnancy service center. Um, and so it's the type of thing that a DCA inspector could determine whether or not something is disclosed or not disclosed because it's simply there. Um, and again, that is uh, sort of in the realm of what is being offered and what is being advertised as opposed to what is actually taking place. Um, even in the pregnancy service, uh, service center context, um, our agency is not actually making a determination about the type of service being provided. How about when you um, work with the domestic workers? Um, and um, we have laws that uh, gives DAC, uh, DCA the authority to enforce our protections with domestic workers, for example. Um, don't you make a determination about who qualifies as a domestic worker? Uh, so if you're referring to the paid care statute, um, the law actually uh, does not give us a particular enforcement authority. Um, it requires us to have a division within our agency um, that focuses on researching the needs of paid care workers and domestic workers. Um, if there is a, if we are if a domestic worker were to make a complaint about a very specific type of law that they are alleging has been broken, that we have the legal authority to enforce, for example, the paid sick leave law, in that instance, uh, our Office of Labor Policy and Standards would conduct a full-on investigation um, the way we would in other cases. But we are typically not making a determination. Um, what about like in, in, in um, immigration uh, fraud cases? We do Are you not making a make determination there what type of service was provided? Uh, typically, no. So um, somebody can just offer any type of immigration service and they can get away with it? So that's, that's the key difference. Um, it's a difference between what is being offered uh, and what is actually being provided. So if I may, um, a particular type of service can be advertised. And... When a DCA inspector is reviewing an advertisement or a DCA attorney, let's say, is reviewing an advertisement, what we are looking at is what does the advertisement say and does the language of that advertisement run afoul of the law? Um, it is difficult for us often to determine, and, and you raise the immigration uh, fraud context, we are not in a position to determine, and we never have, whether or not immigration fraud itself has ever taken place. Um, for example, we don't collect any uh, identifying documents um, if an, uh, an inspection is conducted of, a, of a, a business that purports to provide immigration services. We check to see whether or not the business has engaged in certain contracts with their clients as they are required to. Um, but, you know, what the, for example, USCIS documents are that an individual might have filled out to engage in the provision of immigration service, that is not information we collect. We are not in a position to be able to opine on whether or not the fraud actually occurred. So if this law were to pass and somebody were to come to you with a complaint to say that um, we, uh, you know, I went to, to a psychiatrist and they tried to change my sexual orientation, that doesn't suffice for you to then take action under the proposed legislation? Uh, I think that is a question, that very specific question, the law department would have to opine on. Is that what you're going to come back to um, us with? That's, that's one, of the, one of the many questions that I know the law department is looking at. Um, in general, uh, it is difficult for DCA to determine in a context like this whether or not a particular service uh, has been provided in a very particular way. I'd, I'd like to remind the council that DCA, at the end of the day, is not actually an adjudicatory uh, body. We bring cases, for example, before oath, which is the actual uh, adjudication body that makes a final determination about whether or not a particular type of law has been broken. Um, we write violations based on what we believe to be the case. Um, however, the final determination is not generally, there are some exceptions, but not generally made by us. So just to go back to um, conversion therapy itself, um, 
you know, many common uh, techniques of conversion therapy fall into different forms of child maltreatment. For example, physical abuse is inflicted or allowing someone to inflict physical injury on a child. This includes beating, burning, exorcism. Emotional and verbal abuse is the, is the non-physical maltreatment of a child that can seriously interfere with positive emotional development. Emotional neglect is the failure to supply a child with the support needed for a healthy emotional development. This includes failure to provide warmth, praise, and encouragement. Therefore, shouldn't uh, conversion therapy on minors be explicitly considered child abuse? I would have to defer to my colleagues to, to answer that question. Yeah, and I, I think, not to defer, but I do think the child abuse issue is a child welfare issue for the most part when it comes to ex those exactly what you labeled there. Um, and I think they would have to weigh in on that. It sounds like it, but I think you'd need them to, to address that specifically. So has anybody thought about the best way to reach out to survivors? I'm sorry. Should, oh, no, okay. <laughs> I'm going on a bit here. Uh, what do you think would be the best method to find people who have been victimized um, um, in conversion therapy practices? I know I was a little hard on you before, but uh, would that be an obligation for the health department? I'm sorry, did you say f fine with an E right. or fine with a D? Find, F-I-N-D, F-I-N-D, to locate. Um, because sometimes, look, you know, I was asked by one of the local papers, like, what about these adults who uh, want to go into conversion therapy? Well, I mean, will, are, we going, are we going to continue to allow adults to go into conversion therapy, which is basically quackery, which is based on false psychological understanding of homosexuality in 1973 and affects so many men and women of my age um, because they feel like something was wrong with them when they were brought up, that now they still want to go into conversion therapy? That, I mean, what I'm trying to get to here is that ultimately, we're dealing with fraudulent medical service provision, and we need to put an end to it, and I think New York City should be on the forefront of it for both children and for adults. Okay. So, so I, think, I think the administration very much agrees with you that this is an abhorrent practice and that it should not be taking place in New York City and that it really not only has the capacity to really ruin lives, but in fact does ruin lives. Um, I think there are outstanding questions that the law department is looking at in terms of uh, what would be the best way um, and what would be the best approach for New York City from a legal perspective to be able to take something like this on. I think it is worth noting that um, in the state of New York, and every state is different in terms of its legal landscape, um, but in the state of New York, medical practices and the provision of mental health services, um, including what is permissible and impermissible, in general terms are regulated by the state. And so I think there is a question about the extent to which New York City has the ability to do that locally. And I know that the law department is looking at that question in particular, and I know that um, Commissioner Malalas wanted to add to that. Sure, I was just gonna add kind of uh, what, uh, something that I think tangentially kind of covers your question, uh, Council Member Drum, is you know, I, I wanna say maybe two or three weeks ago, I was actually with Commissioner Bassett at the LGBT Center announcing two very important uh, initiatives that the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has undertaken. One is the creation of an LGBTQ healthcare bill of rights. The other one is a campaign called Bear It All. And I think the emphasis of both of those Department of Health campaigns is really to underscore that in, um, you know, in the medical field or as New Yorkers are, uh, are engaging medical services, uh, that they should be able to be exactly who they are. They should be able to be uh, who they are in terms of their sexual orientation, in terms of their gender identity, in terms of their gender expression, et cetera, and that if they were before some sort of medical provider that was not allowing them to be who they were in all of those different contexts plus more, that one, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene would indeed be helping them, actually uh, you know, assisting them to find uh, medical co medical care or a medical provider who would allow them to be uh, truly who they are and expressing their sexual orientation, their gender identity, and gender expression. And also paired it with, as I said, this uh, LGBTQ healthcare bill of rights so that if people were experiencing some form of discrimination or harassment uh, in trying to access healthcare that they knew that that was against the law, they could avail of resources within the city as you know, such as the Commission on Human Rights. But I, I mentioned both of those initiatives because I think they both strike to, I think, the heart of your question, which is that 
you know, people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning kind of the gamut. Um, there's nothing wrong with, with you because you are any or all of those things. And, um, and these two initiatives, I think, really speak to the fact that in healthcare specifically, people should be uh, comfortable accessing healthcare throughout the city and, and being uh, able to be who they are as a whole person. Well, I, I, I want to go back, though, to the issue of consumer fraud because that's, it seems to me, to be um, the area where I think we could nip this in the bud, actually. Uh, and I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting what the law department comes up with, but to, to practice conversion therapy ultimately is fraudulent. You cannot change someone's sexuality. And um, when they charge a fee for it, and uh, they're allegedly providing services for it, I don't see how the Department of Consumer Affairs can continue to allow a fraudulent practice to continue. Well, the Department of Consumer Affairs is opposed to fraud in all of its forms. Um, we, we work hard, very hard, every day to ensure that New Yorkers are protected. And But you agree that conversion therapy is fraudulent practice. I am not in a position to, while I agree it is abhorrent, um, to whether or not it can be considered from a legal perspective by local law to be fraudulent is one of the questions that the law department is looking at. Um, that is why I can personally state that I think all of us here and everyone I know in the administration is deeply opposed to it and very much agrees that it is a very problematic practice. The extent to which it can be considered fraudulent um, as a legal definition I think is still being looked at. And why is that? That would be a question for the law department to answer. Well, is it primarily based on uh, medical decisions? Again, I, I, I do apologize, Council Member. It, it's not a question that I am qualified to answer. Um, I think the law department is looking at some of the ways in which the city would have the ability to think about this practice um, and treat it as something that we are opposed to and, and therefore would like to be able to regulate. And, and I hear you, Deputy Commissioner, and, I, and I, I think that you're sincere, but I have to really believe that um, what has happened here is that we have allowed the American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association and the American Psychological Association to go on too long saying should or pro should not be practiced or whatever. Um, we need them immediately to declare um, conversion therapy as complete and outright fraud. And those are, these are residue issues from the 1973 ruling. And uh, for them to continue gives them really very little credibility in my mind that they have not yet done that. And I think that's where you're finding some difficulty in defending um, uh, the position between your personal and between um, your professional. So, um, uh, but I do still believe that we need to move forward on this legislation uh, because I do believe that it is fraudulent. Right, and that is true. New Jersey has already ruled that it violates uh, consumer fraud violations. Um, and I said it earlier on, why can't New York be in the front of this? So as I mentioned earlier um, in one of my answers to your questions, mm -hmm. every state has a very different legal landscape, and every state has a different setup when it comes to what it is within the legal realm that the state has the authority to regulate and what the state further delegates to its municipalities to regulate. Um, in the state of New York, we have a particular legal landscape that is set up in a specific way. In New York State, um, medical services and mental health services are regulated at the state level. That does not necessarily mean that there isn't a step that the city could take to begin to regulate this practice, but that is exactly the question that the law, one of the questions that the law department is looking at. What would you think would be a first step that we can take? Again, the law department is examining the extent to which the city of New York would have the ability to regulate this practice. As I mentioned, um, in the state of New York, it is the state that has a legal authority to license and regulate the provision of medical and mental health services. Um, so one, it is, a, it is a threshold legal question as to what is, what, what is the city's ability and authority in this space. Thank you, Chair Mealy. And um, I would really urge the health department to um, put more emphasis on this issue. 
uh, and especially with the um, LGBT group that you're convening. Um, this is something that has a direct negative impact on the community, and, um, and particularly because other states and municipalities are, are looking at this issue as well. So uh, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. And thank you. How long do you think the legal department will take on these questions? Because it makes no sense now. All these answers we need is in the legal department. So how long do you think that's going to take? Yes. Um, respectfully, I think the bill was introduced rather recently. The law department has been doing an examination of this bill as well as many others all at the same time. I can't speak for them. Uh, I, I don't work for the law department. Uh, but I, I know that they are aware that uh, this, is, this is a set of questions that they need to be getting back to us and the, and the council on shortly. Thank you. I'm looking forward to really getting some better information in regards to this. This is a practice needs to be stopped, really. So I'm, we won't hold you. It's no other questions we can ask you. Thank you, Commission. Thank you, Vice. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone, for being here today. Thank you so much for coming, panel. And we'll take a little quick recess, and we have my colleague Matthew Jean vote. Command Civil Rights Continuation of Roll Call on Intro 1259A, Council Member Eugene. Uh, let me say thank you to Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And I vote aye. Okay, the vote now stands at four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have the next panel come up? Matthew Sakara? Sakura. Shuka. Could you, may you come up, please? Jane Sakura. Matthew and Jane. Everett Authors? You could get to, no, right here. Oh, okay. Can we get somebody else? Chair Mealy? Yes. Uh, maybe, may I ask, is somebody staying from the health department? It seemed like everyone has left the out in the hallway. Could you ask? Is, it, Thank is you. anybody staying from, from all three? Thank you. Thank you. You may start, Ms. Everett. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Everett Arthur and I serve as the Government Relations Associate as, at the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community Center, the Center, in New York City. I will testify on four pieces of legislation, Intro 1186, Resolution 614 and 1287, and pre-considered intro um, introduced by Speaker Mark Viverito. Thank you to Councilmember Darlene Mealy for convening a hearing on such important topics for the LGBT community today. Since 1983, the center has empowered our community members to lead authentic lives while advocating for justice, equity, and opportunity for LGBT people. While this translates into many life-altering and affirming experiences for the people who walk through our doors, some communities, like transgender and gender nonconforming people, are impacted far greater because external resources and protections for them are far and few between. As co-founder and current administrator of the New York State LGBT Health and Human Services Network, the network, the center is particularly connected to the evolving statewide needs of the LGBT community. Additionally, the center began providing services for the transgender and gender nonconforming community in 1991 with the establishment of our Gender Identity Project, GIP, the first transgender peer counseling and empowerment program in New York State. Our 25-year history of serving transgender individuals has afforded us unique insight into the particular hardships faced by transgender and gender nonconforming people. Our firsthand knowledge tells us this. Transgender and gender nonconforming people face unique challenges related to their gender expression and gender identity inside New York State in the United States as a whole and internationally. And while we may not be able to directly impact how transgender and gender nonconforming people and other members of the LGBT community are treated outside of the United States, 
It is imperative that we declare in New York and in the United States that LGBT people are safe from discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodations, and bias-motivated crimes. We know that the discrimination faced by LGBT people, LGB, LGBT people is only compounded by race and ask that these issues be examined under an intersectional lens as well. Intro 1186 is the first step needed to protect LGBT people right here in New York City. Passing local legislation may incentivize other cities to follow New York's lead, but we should not stop there. The center hopes that all LGBT New Yorkers will be protected from facing discrimination for their sexual identity, gender identity, or gender expression. This is why New Yorkers need gender. Resolution 614 protects New Yorkers at the state level, and we applaud the Assembly for passing gender for eight consecutive years. However, in each of those eight years, the Senate failed to move on legislation. The New York City Council represent 8.5 million New Yorkers. A resolution from this body on behalf of these residents will send a strong message to both houses of the state legislature that we take protections of all our residents seriously and that this legislation is a step in that direction. In light of the current administration's silence and erasure regarding the treatment of LGBT people, our state must clearly support LGBT people now more than ever. All New Yorkers should be able to rely upon the state to fight for their best interest, and that includes but is not limited to passing agenda. Next, Resolution 1287 protects New Yorkers and Americans on federal level, and we applaud Council Members Drum, Crowley, Menchaca, Chin, and Constantinidis for supporting the Equality Act. While all LGBT people would benefit from the passing of the act, transgender and gender nonconforming people will be particular beneficiaries of this legislation. Amending the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Fair Housing Act to include sexual orientation and gender identity among the prohibited categories of discrimination or segregation in employment, places of public accommodation and housing, will save lives by ensuring that LGBT people and perceived LGBT people can access jobs, housing, and public safety without enduring discrimination or segregation that may result in their homelessness, starvation, or death. While the enactment of these protections will greatly further the safety of LGBT New Yorkers and Americans, this is not enough. Part of protecting the lives of LGBT New Yorkers is normalizing our stories, normalizing our families, and normalizing our identities. However, this cannot be done until conversion therapy is unlawful in New York State. According to San Francisco State University's research on the issue of family acceptance of LGBT youth, LGBT youth that were rejected by their parents because of their LGBT identity were eight times more likely to have attempted suicide, nearly six times as likely to report high levels of depression, more than three times as likely to use illegal drugs, and more than three times as likely to be at high risk for HIV and STDs. Making conversion therapy unlawful will affect the lives of LGBT people in tangible ways by telling them that New York sees you and accepts you just as you are. For this reason, we strongly urge that council act on this legislation forthwith. Finally, as Commissioner Malalas noted, I would like to note that the Center's Training Institute offers cultural competency trainings and our Trans Training Collective specifically works with city agencies to train agency employees on issues of gender identity equity and how to create an affirming environment for the community, particularly transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. The Center would be honored to continue to provide guidance and expertise on these issues once this legislation is enacted. We must continue fighting to protect the lives of all New Yorkers from discrimination, and these pieces of legislation are necessary to create a much needed, safer environment. I'm going to have my mother speak first because I don't know, she's cute and I wanted to let her do that. <laughs> um, but who I am, uh, my name is Matthew Shurka. I am a survivor of conversion therapy um, here in New York City. I'm a national advocate, a national spokesperson with numerous organizations for ending conversion therapy, and I've been doing that work for the last five years. Um, being tr from, New York, from the New York area and have been treated in New York City, um, I'll speak to that experience. Uh, I'll let my mom speak um, about her experience first. <laughs> you can see this, yeah. First of all, I want to thank you for letting me be heard. And I'm here as a parent uh, who, ha who put her son through conversion therapy because of her ignorance. And I'm speaking here for other 
parents speaking out to them because uh, they don't know and I didn't understand anything about being gay. So I put my son through conversion therapy. I will read what I wrote because I can, this way I'll remember everything I wanna say. Uh, this journey that my family went through was most difficult, especially for my son. As a mother seeing her son and not accepting his true self at the hands of a conversion therapist is disheartening to say the least. My husband and I were both ignorant and we were concerned for our son's future. What it would his life be like as a gay man? My husband was truly worried about our son's life. He decided to seek out a conversion therapist in 2004. Matt was 16 years old. This is where our nightmare began. Matt was a good student, a typical de developing teenager, into his schoolwork and having fun. The therapist told my husband and Matt there is no such thing as being gay, that all we needed to hear, that there was some kind of trauma in Matt's life that made him this way. Matt was searching for his trauma. For five years, he was searching to blame anyone who he thought might have caused his trauma, but he came up empty. The mood swings started, anxiety developed. He woke up every day not knowing who he was. I am sure deep down he knew he was gay in his soul, but he was scared to let it come out. He wanted to please his therapist and father and was afraid of how the world will perceive him. Shortly after Matt began this therapy, I knew Matt is gay and we needed to address this. So I went on my own personal bandwagon to help my son to accept his orientation and be proud of who he is. All I would think about is, please God, help him accept himself. I went through hell with Matt, agonizing over the therapy and being gay every day. Matt was put in a position by his therapist to question who he was and who he should be. Try to imagine that. So I was on a mission to have my son accept himself and for me to understand what it is to be gay. I read novels by gay authors, gay self-help books. I spoke to my son and really listened, observing his interactions with people and, of course, meeting lots of gay people myself. What I observed was that there is no difference between gay and straight in regard to their hopes and dreams. We all want the same things, love and acceptance. I don't blame my husband or myself as much as I blame the licensed therapist we hired. He guided and convinced us that Matt's orientation can change when we didn't know any better. I am sure there are a lot of people like my husband and I who fed into this therapy. A good therapist would say to, say to parents, we cannot change your son or daughter's orientation, but we can help you understand it and make peace with it. If conversion therapy is not available to minors, parents will then question themselves and realize there's a good reason not to do it. We must pass this bill and make conversion therapy illegal in New York. If it weren't illegal when my son was coming out, he may not have lost five precious years of his life to, a, to this dangerous practice, and I could have been a proud mom of a gay son a lot sooner. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't need, actually don't need this. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Matthew Shurka. Um, I grew up in uh, Great Neck, New York, which is just outside, 30 minutes from Manhattan. Um, and I came out to my father uh, when I was 16 years old. Um, and my father was awesome and really loving about my, about my coming out, uh, but had his own fears of what that meant for my life. And my father had never heard of conversion therapy or reparative therapy and uh, did his own research and came across a conversion therapist here in Manhattan who explained to him that there is no such thing as being anything of the LGBTQ spectrum and that all childhood traumas lead to this, um, I, they call it a psychological void or reaction to traumas that get acted out in s sexuality. And that if I can heal the trauma through therapy, then my, what they call SSA, SSA is same, same sex attraction, that's what I, the disorder I suffered from, then if I went through the, the therapy and healed the trauma, then I would um, experience opposite attraction over time and naturally, because that's the, what they believe I am innately. Um, so what that actually looked like, um, I fit the, the actual, you know, I guess, exp um, description. I'm the, I have two older sisters, a mom. There was a lot of feminism, according to this therapist in my home. 
And so I had to take away as, the, uh, as much femininity in my home as possible and to increase the amount of masculinity so I can identify with my male peers. What that actually looked like in reality was I didn't, um, was not allowed to speak to my mother for about three years, including my two sisters. Um, now my mother and father didn't agree about this um, and I didn't physically separate from her, so what that looked like was me waking up in the morning for school, mom made me breakfast, and I'd walk out the door not saying a word. Uh, eventually, just you know, coming from a conservative Jewish home, this started to break my family apart and my mother and father's disagreements about what my therapy was doing to me and my siblings. Um, I believe that I believe that therapy was working. Um, I became more popular at school uh, when I was ready to engage and have sexual in interaction with women. I succeeded, um, but my grades would fail. I had anxiety. Um, I would gone to the hospital numerous times for anxiety attacks, and. When I was no longer being able to perform, the therapist was prescribing me Viagra pills to continue to affirm my heterosexuality. Um, so over a course of five years, I was treated in four different states. Uh, specifically, I started here in Manhattan. Um, my conversion therapist who treated me in Manhattan still works to this day. Um, actually, because of the last questions you asked previously, um, I, just, I looked him up and he still advertised on psycholog uh, psychology today. Uh, one of the problems with these psychotherapists is that in, because of the movement and what's happening in the country, they're not advertising, some do actually in the country, but here in New York, they're saying that we are, do we deal with sexuality issues or sexuality problems and don't want to point specifically to reparative therapy or conversion therapy. Um, so Gerald Schoen, Schoen Wolf is my former conversion therapist who uh, still works, uh, he's on 17th Street near Union Square and treating minors and adults uh, to alter their sexuality from homosexuality to heterosexuality. It doesn't go the other way around because they believe homos anything of the LGBTQ spectrum is the disorder. Um, since, so since now I'm 29 years old, I advocate across the country. Um, this bill is particularly very important. Um, I can answer any of the questions from the previous panel. <laughs> As a part of my uh, job of what I've done in the last five years is to do this research. And um, every single medical organization and psychiatric organization in the country has um, is against the use of conversion or reparative therapy. If it was up to the American Psychological Association, um, they would end it completely. They already currently will take away a license if a therapist is caught doing it. The reason we went to the state level is because it is the state that licensed the therapist. And it, so the APA is limited up to a certain point. Now, I know the city and the state have different rules and regulations, but Knowing what is what the APA has done on, on what's happening around the country, um, I will work with everyone from the health commissioner's office to give them the information that they need. Um, the case in New Jersey is really important. It's it was a lawsuit, so the lawsuit which we now use as case law was um, the verdict was that conversion therapy is consumer fraud. If you cannot promise or prove that I can turn a homosexual into a heterosexual, then taking money for that service is fraudulent. So we have the case law there available, which um, specifically to that case in New Jersey, the, their offices were based in Jersey City. And their target market as a business is the New York City tri-state area. So th even though that specific case was there, I think it fully applies uh, here to New York. Um, from a financial point of view, my family over five years spent $30,000 on my conversion therapy. Um, it is a business. Uh, there's a lot of money involved. Um, so we can, we can talk about that. Um, and the last thing I'll say um, before we move on to questions is just that um, I'm a, a proud gay man and a proud New Yorker, and New York City is a place w that people from all over the country run to to come out of the closet. I mean, in, in most liberal cities, you don't even have to call them little, but big cities, we can look at San Francisco, we can look at Atlanta, but especially New York. And, um, you know, so we are a safe haven for these individuals, and... Um, because this bill includes adults, we know that conversion therapy doesn't, it doesn't work for anyone. The APA does not say, oh, it doesn't work for minors, but it totally works for an adult. We know that it doesn't work, period, even though this is the first bill of its kind to include, or amendment, sorry, to include all ages. So I think, like, I think as a city, as a New York as a city, which we are a great safe haven for all these individuals, it's important that we do lead the way. And... If I think about all the individuals that move to New York City to find a safe place, they do give up a lot. They give up you know, their community, many give up talking to their parents, they give up their religious background, and they, and they do lose a lot of stability. 
in their life and have to find new stability and new communities here in New York. And I think a lot of these conversion therapists use that. You know, some, if certain individuals fall into drug addiction or feeling lonely, these conversion therapists are using that as an advantage to say, well, come back to the stability and try to see a heterosexual life as a way to feel stable in your life. Um, and that's when the individuals I meet who actually try conversion therapy as adults. Um, I meet people from age 70, 50, 40 that still try because they're lost. They lost their homes and they either fell into drugs or got sick with the HIV virus or other ST, STDs. Um, so it's more about creating New York to be a safe place for those individuals and create community here for people who are looking for a safe place. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I just have one. Um, the last administration was saying that there's none in New York. Are you telling me they can't look that up and see what businesses are, are still doing this process right now? So I feel they were not forthcoming with us, really. So I know we have to address that. I think there's a, you know, as New Yorkers, we have an assumption that that things are cool are cool here, <laughs> and that you know that doesn't happen here. And most people who meet me and I say I was treated by the six chain on, in Union Square, they're shocked that it, that it happens here. So um, you know, I do research. I just came came back from San Diego where there was a conversion therapy conference occurring, and, and I attended to speak with people there. It was four hundred people who were seeking to whether therapists, pastors or people themselves all looking to convert. And there was a gentleman there who represented HigherGround.NYC. It is a conversion therapy center four blocks from Stonewall. So to think that it doesn't exist, it exists. And they're hiding. So if you look their, if you go to HigherGround.NYC, they don't have an address. Their PO box is located at the Madison Center near Penn Station. And they are avoiding what the movement is, which is we are seeing a huge wave of ending of conversion therapy. Eight That's, yeah, go ahead. Do you think it has shock therapy in it also? There are many rep there are many reports and friends of mine who've experienced electric shock therapy. Yes. Now, does that specific this place is do so it? Yes. Archaic. So, electric shock therapy is legal, unfortunately. I mean, or for, for I mean, well, it depends what it's used for. It's usually used for in the medical practice for depression. Mm -hmm. But the fact that a psychotherapist or any medical professional can say I can use electric shock therapy to cure your homosexuality is absurd. And that's what's damaging because it's never been proven or it worked in such regard. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Drew. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for that really moving testimony. It's just incredible to hear that you uh, were treated, quote unquote, on 17th Street um, in Union Square, where everybody thinks, oh, you know, it's Greenwich Village or east of Greenwich Village, in that area anyway. Yeah. And uh, everything should be so cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think also. Um, some churches are still um, uh, preaching this as well, you know, and uh, the Catholic Church, you know, they have a group called Courage, which uh, encourages abstinence minimally and hopefully uh, conversion therapy, and um, that still goes on. And so whether they're licensed or not, they still encourage it, but it's still quackery because you can't convert somebody's or change somebody's sexuality. Um, so what was that term you used, SSA disorder? Yes. <laughs> Can you describe that a little bit for me? So because they don't believe in home, anything of the LGBTQ spectrum, everyone is innately heterosexual, according to them. So when you're in the therapy, you don't, you're don't you not gay. You describe your condition as SSA, same-sex attraction. So when I was in my therapy, I had to, you know, how when did I discover my SSA? Is it stronger today? Is it less today? Is my SSA disappearing? Am I finding myself more attracted to females now? So you just the, the acronym is a way to describe it as a condition uh, that you will eventually rid of. So when you went to this, uh, was it a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist? A uh, psychotherapist. Psychotherapist. How did they get into the? Did you go there specifically to change your sexuality, your sexual orientation? Yeah, I was sixteen, um, uh, and then you know my father was the one who found the therapist. And how did he find one that he thought would be? willing to do so he, he my father had never heard of conversion therapy he didn't know what it was but as a for my father it wasn't religious it, it was the fact that i was so young and if he could offer me what he believed was a better life as a straight man worried about persecution my job life my family life 
he, you know, he would say, I would, I would definitely give you that opportunity, especially if there's a psychotherapist who's a trained professional can offer this. For my father, it was an opportunity. When he described it to me, I was 16 and terrified. I was worried about losing my father's love and ap approval. I was worried about my community. And I'm being told that what life would be like as an out gay man and what ho horrors I would have to go through. So my 16-year-old self went into it thinking, like, I got to give this my best shot. And so it, and not a single point did I not try. I, for five years, continued uh, to do everything I could to become a heterosexual. Um, I don't even know where to start, really, sometimes. On things, but um, what I was trying to get at, really, is, like, um, did they openly advertise uh, that they could change your sexual orientation, or did it come up in therapy where the doctor says, oh, would oh. you like to change your sexuality, or how did that, how did that happen? Because I don't know that there are there many uh, psychiatrists or psychotherapists today that would outwardly say, you know, or advertise that um, I can... Um, yeah, so if you go to Higher Ground's website, they specifically say Higher that they, Ground, will, they will deal with your SSA, specifically. And where's Higher Ground's located? I don't have the exact address because I'm trying to find it. I just discovered them over the weekend. Um, but they, he, the, I met the executive director, and he specifically said he's four blocks from Stonewall, and he's proud to be there so he can... Oh, four that's where he meets Stonewall. new clients. Mm -hmm. Those are his words. So I'm also interested because my mother had the same reaction, but I'm a lot older than you. <laughs> I, uh, I came out in 1973 to my mother, and, um, and my mother said, you know, it wasn't being gay that was so much uh, what she feared. It was the discrimination that she feared, you know, mm -hmm. in my life. Uh, fortunately for me, she did not recommend, um, uh, you know, therapy. Um, but I'm just wondering if you could describe a little bit more your personal reaction to thinking that there might be a cure, so to speak. I, uh, myself, I was uh, extremely ignorant. And when he said he's confused, I mean, I believed always that you're born gay. That's, just, that's the extent of I, my thought process about being gay. I didn't know anything else, but that, I felt that you, uh, you were born gay. Um, but when he, my son says he's confused and he, and he needs help, and my, my husband said, you know, we have to help him, and he was concerned. So I said, okay. I, you know, I, I was just to totally ignorant. He said the first six weeks he's going to be straight. I said, okay. That's said, okay, we're going to fix said? this. We're going to fix this. It'll be okay. It'll fit like everybody else. And I saw that's not happening. I realized that this is not ha I now looked at my 16-year-old son. Before that, I didn't see anything that would make me think he was gay. So I'm looking at him now. Now I see that he's gay. This is not. You know, a mother knows her child. And, and that's it. Uh, you real, you know, you, you, I can see it. And I understood it. And I said, this is wrong. And um, we, I tried to, you know, uh, have him stop. But, you, you know, when you have this, when somebody's telling you that we can be straight, straight, he, and he's a child, and he says, you know what, I have to try. I, you know, because if I said anything that you're gay, he would be very upset with me. Yeah, so it, he, he already got this in his head already. This professional, I'm going to get the mom. It's just amazing to me that we are still not at the point where we can think that, you know, it's just okay to be gay, you know, and people still think that, you know, there's some way that you should fix the person or whatever. It's just amazing to me, but hopefully one day we'll get there. Yes, sir. Um, Thank you, Chair. Councilman Drum, uh, Higher Ground is at 470 West 24th Street, New uh, York, New York. Okay, great. I mean, it's uh, not next to Soma, but that was his description. Um, yes. At I was at the Restore Hope Conference. If you want to look that up, it's an organization, specifically Christian-based, but uh, the pastors are licensed individuals, and that's and because the conference took place in California, they have to deal with the fact that it's already illegal for minors there. Um, but that was his description, and um, uh, yeah, from the executive director. But thank you for finding that out. Yeah, I, I that might be. I don't know if that's the exact address or their PO box address because their website has a PO box address. Just well, it's West Twenty Fourth Street, New York one zero zero one one. So okay. they have a zip code, so it okay. should be a regular mailbox. Okay, even, even that they're they're headquartered or whatever, picking up mail from you means they're somewhere local. But okay. um, at least yeah. it's local. We could start from there. Yeah, I mean, so so it's it's here, it's happening, and it continues to happen. And until um, New York City. Uh, does something and the administration steps up to the plate on this, uh, we're going to have it see it continue to go on right here in New York City. I know. Yeah. I just Thank want you. to commend you. 
thank you for all that you do and keep being an advocate. Thank you. We're going to have our next panel. Thank you. Brooke Sida, Sida Guzman. Cicelina Gentili and Lundell Abando Abando. That's good. That's cool. Thank you. Anyone can start. I'd rather have uh, Cecilia start first because yeah. she okay, can actually go. live to um, first hand. Uh, she lived um, um, the hell that a lot of our, our black and brown uh, trans sisters uh, still go through every day uh, and without any hope. So I will really uh, I want to encourage you to be uh, very explicit as you can so you can really move them. Um, hi, uh, thank you all uh, for having this hearing. Um, before we start, I wanted to say, like, I'm also a survivor of um, conversion therapy, and it happened to me when I was about five years old. And in my case, it was Argentina, it was the 70s, uh, you know, it was a dictatorship, you know, all that was kind of encouraged. Um, <clears throat> so I'm happy that today we're talking about this right here because, you know, the, the fact that it's still happening is appalling to me, and I really cannot believe it. In my case, uh, it took um, 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 hormone replacement therapy, and the other way I was given testosterone as a, as a five years old, uh, which is uh, unthinkable. Um, <clears throat> because of uh, all that um, uh, suffering, like, you know, I developed uh, um, a, a series of, like, um, uh, mental uh, mental health issues that took me into like um, uh, using drugs for so many years and um, because of that I end up in jail and uh, it was a, a very dark place in, 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 in my life. Uh, when I seek recovery, I went into recovery and I was placed with men uh, in New York City. And we're talking about seven years ago, right? So I did 17 months of long-term treatment, living, showering, sleeping, and uh, having my days with men. And I look exactly like now, and I felt exactly how I feel now, which is a woman. Um, at the time, it was very important for me to get my recovery, and I decide to go through with it, uh, but it's um, somehow, mir miraculously, it, it worked in my favor, but it could have been uh, actually much more worse than what I was looking for, right? Uh, during that time, I was encouraged to become a productive member of society. Uh, I believe that transgender people cannot be there, uh, cannot uh, get to dream to uh, do what they want to do and <coughs> become what we call productive members of society. Let's, we have to define that, right, also. But, um, uh, because it's not enough um, protections uh, for us. As a transgender person, I was denied a home. I went with my part. We call on the phone, we gave our uh, um, uh, social security numbers, they ran our scores, um, everything was great. I am privileged enough to have a job, so I had like pay stops to show and everything. They said the apartment is gonna be yours, you know, for sure, 98 point, you know, 99.9% .9 that the apartment is yours, everything is okay, until I show up to see it. And I was told in my face that the apartment wasn't going to be given to us and that they couldn't explain why that we had to go. And that's it. You have no apartment. And it's specifically when I show up 
the, the broker was talking in the corner with my partner, talking about how the apartment looked like, and when I show up, that changed. Right? Um, I also go to, uh, you know, I, I, I'm lucky enough to have like a great medical provider that is also transgender. How doesn't get better than that, right? But I get sick on the weekends and I have to go to the hospital, right? And I will encounter several horrible feelings of, um, you know, uh, being discriminated and not being protected. Um, I do know that the city has like a commission on human rights where we can like, you know, uh, make um, um, our complaints and things like that. But, you know, all of this is very new, talking about a period of life. and. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, although like the city and the state had been working into achieving equality, sometimes equality is not enough. We have to create equity, right? For those, you know, uh, communities that didn't have anything for so long, we need that extra step that would take us there to be at the same level than the rest. I was also um, in jail in a uh, in Rikers Island, living with men. Uh, We're going to ask you some questions afterwards, yes. too. Thank you. Okay. Hello, my name is Lindell Urbano. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Government Relations at Amedicare. Um, Amedicare is a not-for-profit uh, Medicaid health plan. We focus on providing comprehensive health services to um, people who are living with chronic conditions, people who are living with HIV, people who are homeless, and uh, generally people who are at high risk of being at risk of, uh, at, uh, being of acquiring HIV. Um, so the, we're here to support this legislation because we believe that LGBT people in New York City deserve to be treated with, with, with equal rights and dignity. It's all. It's primarily about dignity, right? And so, the we know what it means would mean for our members in the communities we serve. And in 2017, it's unconscionable that people who are still are still being denied their employment and subject to discrimination, and degrading and demeaning conversion therapy and even violence simply be based on their per, their actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender expression, or identity. Right, the the proposed measures here that are proposed today, like the resolutions and the legislation, really demonstrate New York City's commitment to the LGBTQ community, and sets an example for other jurisdictions that all people should be treated with respect and dignity. Um, and we urge passage of this legislation. Uh, I would say also like to add that in a time when basic access to health care and safety net programs for hardworking New Yorkers are threatened <coughs> by federal proposals to tear apart Medicaid and the U.S. social safety net, it's more important than ever that New York City really uh, stands strong and secure its framework of, inclusi of inclusiveness. Right? Uh, as we heard earlier today, there are holes here. <laughs> You know, we need to do more, and we need to do all that we can as a city to protect the rights of uh, LGBTQ people. Uh, f for us as a health plan, it's really important that we um, address the needs of the people who are most underserved. Uh, one population that's tremendously underserved is the transgender community. Uh, surveys that have been done show that that uh, transgender people face really high barriers accessing <coughs> health care, accessing employment, accessing just the basic services that keep them healthy and well. And unfortunately, um, people who are living people who are transgender have a much higher chance of get, of acquiring HIV than other populations. And that there's no good reason for that other than the fact that they are discriminated against and singled out for these really this really unconscionable treatment. At Amedicare, we, we work hard to really make sure that people who are transgender receive quality and competent care, access to care. We have over 400 people who are transgender in our plan, and we, are, we welcome them. And we, we're seeking to serve even more. Uh, we want to serve people whether they're HIV positive, transgender people whether they're HIV positive or not. And we've been advocating for that for years, and finally the state is giving, in October of this year, 
will give us the ability to do that. And we will continue to provide those services to people. And um, I will just like to end by saying thank you for having this hearing. This is incredibly important. And we urge passage of the legislation and the resolutions. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brooke Serda Guzman. Uh, I was born uh, in 1965 in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. I'm very nervous. Um, you know, I've been here since um, 1989. And the reason I'm nervous is because, you know, uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of black and brown trans women's lives uh, depend on, on, on your mercy, on uh, your sense of decency. Um, I've been uh, dedicating the last seven years of my life uh, as a, a, to be a community organizer and a her historian, and I have seen, um, uh, you know, horrors uh, at all levels on, on the ground field. I, I see uh, so many black trans women that the only option is to sell their body, engage in survival sex, while we continue, uh, you know, I say me and uh, Cecilia, we are the exception. Uh, you know, we are, we are like, you know, very rare that you see, uh, as, uh, especially a black trans woman, um, you know, achieve what we had achieved. So um, I'm, I'm just here because I'm really, really angry. Um, I, I really feel, think this is foul play. The fact that we are going to be asked questions by cis people who have nothing to, to do with, the, with, with our community, and they want nothing to do with our community. I have sent emails, calls to various city councils. Latisha James, we lost the main support group that we had here in New York City two years ago at Housing Works on 13th Street uh, twice a week. We was able to have dinner and a metro card uh, at the Trans Empowerment Project. It was downsized to uh, a PHP, and uh, now, uh, you know, barely you get uh, 10 uh, trans women of color, 10 trans women, period, uh, in a tiny little room while, you know, Charles King just like, you know, say, well, you know, I have to go to East New York. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was a huge loss, and uh, I felt totally uh, blocked. I feel like, you know, we have so many out gay men and, and women uh, in office, in public offices, and they're all gatekeepers. They don't let trans women in office. If we are not in office, you know, <clears throat> if we don't have anybody to tell us where the next blow is going to be coming from, I mean, we, we are lost. We are lost. You know, it's, I just saw the privilege to have, you know, gay people from here, this side, from gay people from that side. You know, it's a lot of homocentrism. That's homocentrism. I don't know if this thing is on. Is this on? Okay, so, so that's uh, homocentric. Give us a break. Give us a break. My sisters are dying. Last year, we lost at least 25 black trans women in this country. It was a slaughterhouse. You will think this year they will come out with a vengeance to pass the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act. No, the same, the same. That's the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So, so a lot of lives are on the line. And it, by playing respectability politics, by like, you know, I mean, a lot of trans women like myself, I didn't know I was a woman until I was 40 years old. That's, that's how impossible it is. And every time you try to assert yourself, they tell you that you're crazy. We don't even need conversion therapy. I don't know what happened to me, but I can, I, I'm almost certain that I was abused as a baby. You know, uh, there was a case five years ago in Long Island. This, this father shook his baby so much because he was acting so feminine that he killed him, you know, for, for expressing, you know, femininity. Uh, we are women. We are women of trans experience. Uh, and there's no doubt in, 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 my, in, in any of my bones that the feminine essence lives in me. And the feminine essence demands me, you know, to, to, to be myself, to live in, in my truth. I know a lot of gays are taking that out, that out from, you know, Lois Ashley Hunter, that she started saying, you know, uh, living in our truth, and now everybody's living in their truth. Every time we do something, they appropriate our culture, not ours, I mean, from black trans women. 
you know, everything. It was a black trans woman who started the, the Stonewall uprising. And, and still, we hear now in conversion therapy, only, I mean, like five out of the, the 10 people uh, speaking, there was talking about sexual orientation. And, and it, can be, it can be either either way. It can be either way because, you know, they tell you, you're a gay man. You're a gay man, and that's our, your prison. That's your prison. That's, that's all you can be. You're just a gay man. And you tell no, and you think that you're crazy. So, so you know, a lot of us, we go crazy into drugs, addiction, and, 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 and whatnot. Um, you know, that we have to make safe spaces for, for my black trans sisters to be here in this room. They don't feel safe, and, and they feel burned out. We have been promised so many times, so many things. You know, I currently, I am the vice chair of the client advisory board at GMAC. And every time I approach one of my sisters, they roll their eyes. Say, girl, I, have, I was there before you. And they did me wrong. And, and so on and so on. We have now Audre Lorde Project. They fired the only trans woman they have working at their trans justice project. You know, you know, it's just like, how can you have a project called Trans Justice with, with no, especially no black trans women, which is like, it's a social justice organization and preaching that you have to be intentional and intersectional, but they are the least <laughs> intersectional and in, or intentional. So I, I am very, very, very uh, upset. I, I, I want you all to, to think like uh, so many lives are, are, are on the line. So many lives, you know, you know, um, you know I mean, you know, as a light-skinned, pale Mexican woman, you know, I, I have to hold. I have to be aware of my privilege. I have had a lot of privilege. I have had a YouTube channel for almost two years. I have not been shut down. I have seen, uh, uh, you know, Facebook pages, Twitter accounts from Black people being shut down, and not being listened to. You know, so imagine now, uh, you know, being a Black woman, and then on top of that, being trans. That's another visible identity that waits on you. And like Cecilia said, every time you show up. They might like you over the phone or an email, but the moment you show up, unexpectedly, everything unravels and nothing comes through for us. With no protections, no nothing. We are the only community that's homeless. We don't have a, a national community center for trans women. I have been, for the last seven years, I've been knocking on doors because I'm undocumented. I said, please, I need somebody with a green card to put in the 501c3 so we can get, you, you know, our bylaws and, and our, our mission and our vision and the board of directors and have a house just like the one uh, the gay men have on, on 13th Street. And if you don't believe me that's the gay center, just shoot them up an email. It will be such and such at thegaycenter.org. So that's a very, very, uh, uh, you know, cis-normative institution that I don't know a trans woman feels welcome at, Thank you know. You. Thank you. I would love, do you have any questions? I just have one question. Um, how often have you used the Human, um, human <coughs> Rights Commission? I used it once. I did it at the time that that happened. I didn't know about it, right. so I didn't. Um, it didn't How occur did to me. How did you find to, out about it? I did find out because I work. I, I'm the director of policy at GMAC, so we work closely with them. So now I do know and I follow, like you know, every step that I need to get there. Because um, it's very important. It's against yeah. that's discrimination in yeah. housing. I passed that legislation I, in regards to gender. So I would love to <coughs> know how. We can let everyone know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Once like organizations are doing a great work in like spreading, you know, the word. Um, I wanted to say, since like you know, you you can allow me to. It is um, uh, places that, as um, um, uh, Council Member Drum said, that are um, religious, that are, um, and, and I can show you in in social media how they promote that they will cure you. They they will you know take away and and you know they have pictures of like you know. Uh, trans woman and how they became men, and uh, um, and they're free, and they're f they're free. Free. Yeah, you don't you you know you just have to attend that that church. So oh, that's the happening. Do yeah, it yeah, free. yeah. Okay. They do you know, but it's happening. So okay. sometimes it's not just about money. It's about I guess <coughs> like the message that that sends. And um, okay. yeah. Can I ask you another question? Why are you yeah. incarcerated? Were you on on any hormone? Pills or anything? No, I wasn't given anything, and I was. Were you on? Yes. Did they supply? No, 
that's a problem. Yeah. I've been speaking with the um, correction, the police, everyone. That's a problem. You're supposed to still get your medical. So I wasn't another. getting anything. I was also detoxing from heroin, and I wasn't given um, the medicine. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so but it was. Thank you for being here. You look fabulous. Well, thank you for having To answer me. your question, I've sent about 10 um, uh, trans women and two trans men uh, to the Commission on Human Rights, and none of them got results. So I stopped. I stopped. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to refer them to the same thing with Anti Violence Project, uh, Silver Rivera Law Project, and stuff like that. You know, it's just like they start the cases very strong. Sure, we are here for you. And in mid, in mid air, they drop it, and then it's like, you know, communication. I. You know, I don't have anything nice to say to say about about these organizations. So you should always follow up, whatever area it is. Speak to the council member of that area. Let them follow up just as well, because no matter what, if you're making that call, something is wrong. So we have to keep documenting it. That's the only way we can get things really done and bring it to the forefront. So please don't give up. Always give out that number. Make sure if we don't have the <laughs> data. To know what is going on, we really can't address it. Well, yeah, but it, it, it's just like myself. I, I'm by myself. I don't have no salary. I'm living on HASA. I'm a Amida Care client, and I have never been supported by Amida Care. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, three weeks ago, they shut down my benefit card, which I had already updated, updated my information because I, 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 I'm still in the process of aligning my document, all my documentation, okay. my gender identity. It's not a transition. It's an alignment. But these people, they call it transition. It's like transition. You transition to another life, you know, when you die. So, so it's an alignment. So I had already uh, aligned my benefit card, uh, and they shut it down. And I called my HASA worker, and she said, I don't know what happened. Uh, the next day she said, oh, they sent me an email saying that you need to bring a proof of, uh, that you had a vaginoplasty in order for us to to." Uh, to give you a, a update, which the Medicaid, the benefit cards are not even gender anymore. And, no. and what about my name? So, so they, they, I went to 16th Street, I believe, and 16th Street by Union Square. Mm -hmm. uh, I, they blasted that name over the microphone. I say, I did not update it. They gave me the heads, up, the heads up saying that it was not going to be the name of my, of my national, you know, my New York State ID. It was not going to be the name. They gave me the heads up, but they did not give me the heads up that they were going to blast that so name. maybe you need to sit down with one of the elected officials. I have free immigration lawyers. I am free all day. I'm just sitting by my house by my phone. Nobody every calls Wednesday me. They're blocking me. They're lawyers. actually blocking me every from everything Thursday I want to do. Because these people, they think they know better than us. Well, we need the documentation. Well, I want to thank this panel. I really appreciate it. And Amelia Care is right there. You could speak to him in the hallway. Well, I have spoke to so many Amida Care representatives. We have the and, and, and right they here. saw that they saw that they, they reversed my gender marker He's and the right name. He's right here. Let's try to make something happen. Timing is everything. Thank you so much. Thank you for this. Oh, I'm sorry. You want Okay. Yeah, I just want to say that there's there's still a lot of more uh, topics to, 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 to talk yes. about. I mean, I we, think we, we have no... I Drum for bringing this... Yeah, but but we have we, yeah we depend on, on on crumbs. These are these are crumbs basically. We don't have any anyone of us, anybody who looks like us, really in, in the in any position, anything. Not even a secretary. Not even the the person who brings the coffee. So, no, so I can't say. Mm -mm. Well, I okay. So yeah, bring the coffee. Uh, you know, uh, that's that's not progress. It's 2017. Mm -hmm. 2017, Barney Frank, they kick us out of, of, uh, of the bill saying that we're going to focus on marriage equality. And he, they were going to come back for, for trans women. And they never did. They, he, he quit. So, so we're still waiting. When is our turn? When is our turn? This year, we have nine black trans women murdered so far this year. To no avail, nobody... Where is the outrage? Where is the, you know... I mean, it's like, for, for real. I have I have... I have the most concern you just gave for us my the sisters. Outrage here. This is on public television. People will see, and maybe we'll start something. Got to start somewhere. Well, I, sh I should hope so because. And I, I hope you get your five. You know, I'm not going anywhere. Even if I get deported, trust me. Wherever I am, I'm going to continue. And and you know, this is an outrage. This is Keep this is screaming. this is being, being being blocked. This is being being blocked. These are professional gatekeepers. Mm. Thank you. We have a next panel. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
Laverne Betters. Okay. Christine Raskowski. What's that? Bergrinski. It's close. Bergrinski. It took me a few years to learn how to spell it, too. Thank you so much. Ooh. <laughs> I already said that. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Anyone can start. Good afternoon, Chair Mealy and members of the Civil Rights Committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify today, and thank you to those who testify, uh, testified previously on the conversion therapy. Uh, my name is Lauren Betters, and I am a staff attorney at the Gender Equality Law Center, a nonprofit law and advocacy organization. We believe that all individuals should have equal an equal opportunity to, to succeed regardless of gender, gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation. Galk applauds uh, Senator or Council, Me Council Member Drum for drafting intro 1186, calling upon Council to amend this uh, New York City human rights law's definitions of sexual orientation and gender. Currently, the law is more progressive uh, than most states, localities, and federal protections, but this bill gives more visibility to the LGBTQ community and acknowledges a broader scope of sexual and romantic preferences that have not been recognized. Sexuality invisibil invisibility impacts the ability of queer individuals to access health care, earn an equal wage, receive fair treatment in the workplace, and obtain public uh, resources to address their specific needs. Local legislation is becoming increasingly important given our current political climate. Last week, the Department of Commerce removed gender, identity, and sexual orientation from its Equal Opportunity Employment Statement, the federal government's latest attempt to disregard protections specifically drawn out for the LGBTQ community. And the movement for full equality and dignity for people of all sexual orientations and gender identities, New York City must lead the charge by expanding definitions that currently constrain these identities to a limited paradigm. A person's gender is a complex interrelationship between an individual's body, gender identity, and expression. Each of these dimensions can vary greatly across a range of possibilities. Viewing gender as a binary concept fails to capture even the biological aspect of gender, let alone gender identity and gender expression. Even those who vary only slightly from preconceived norms are targets of disapproval, discrimination, harassment, and violence. We see this regularly in our work, from a gay college student being discriminated against on campus to a gender nonconforming uh, kindergartner whose teachers don't know which box to put him in. We are establishing a growing language for gender, and we no longer feel bound to identify um, or express within a strict gender binary, a reflection of a far more nuanced understanding of the experience of gender itself. As fundamental aspects of identity, gender and sexuality deeply influence each part of our lives. When these crucial aspects of self are defined, are narrowly defined or rigidly enforced, individuals who exist outside of a heteronormative and cisgender framework face innumerable challenges. This does not have to be the case. Through recognizing gender diversity in our law and validating each person's experiences, we can develop greater acceptance and protections for all. So we thank the council for its time and respectfully request the passage of intro 1186. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Brzezinski, and I am a legal fellow at the New York Civil Liberties Union, the NYCLU. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Committee on Civil Rights, specifically Council Member Drum, uh, for all of the work that you do to support the LGBTQ community uh, and for allowing the NYCLU to provide testimony today in opposition to Intro 1186 in its current form. Uh, a bill amending the definitions of sexual orientation and gender in the New York City human rights law. Uh, for nearly 100 years, the NYCLU and myself for a much shorter time, uh, has worked in the courts, legislatures, and communities to defend and preserve the individual rights and liberties guaranteed by the United States Constitution and the state of New York, uh, including the right to be free from discrimination on the basis of one's sexual orientation and gender identity. 
Likewise, the New York City Council was on the vanguard of adopting explicit protections for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community in the city's human rights law, one of the most powerful anti-discrimination laws in the country. This law sends a clear signal to employees, landlords, and purveyors of public goods and services that discrimination because of a person's sexual orientation, sex, or gender is unacceptable. For these reasons, the human rights law's definition of sexual orientation and gender are of great importance, but it is a challenge to create definitions that provide clarity while also ensuring that the law protects those it is intended to benefit. We agree with the sponsors of Intro 1186 that maximizing the number and diversity of LGBTQ individuals that are protected from discrimination in public accommodations, employment, and housing is imperative. But because the definitions provided in Intro 1186 are unnecessarily complex and confusing, they have the potential to unduly limit who is protected by the human rights law. Looking first to the definition of sexual orientation in the uh, proposed amendment, we agree that the exec ex existing definition, pardon me, um, which only includes heterosexuality, homosexuality, or bisexuality, does not adequately capture the diversity of sexualities in New York or anywhere. Um, but the proposed definition goes too far in the other direction. By including actual or perceived emotional attraction or attachment to another person, the term conceivably captures any meaningful relationship with another person, including platonic friends and family members. This unduly inflates the law to protect against discrimination in nearly all relationships, thereby unintentionally harming its ability to specifically protect the queer community. Uh, regarding the proposed amendment to the definition of gender, the NYCLU strongly opposes the addition of the phrase operative status. The transgender and gender nonconforming community has long struggled to gain basic rights without proof of gender affirming surgeries. Conflating gender with operative status reinforces the harmful notion that one's gender is defined by their reproductive anatomy. We also oppose the inclusion of the phrase purported sex in the definition of gender. The term purported, meaning to appear or claim to be or do something, especially falsely, has a negative connotation and suggests that there is something false or insincere about a trans person's identity. In fact, it is the belief that transgender people are not, quote, real women or, quote, real men that drives much of the harassment and discrimination that they face. Using the term purported gives credence to this discrimination and it has no place in the city's human rights law. In closing, we urge the committee not to adopt intro 1186 in its current form, but to further consider the most inclusive and effective ways to define sexual orientation and gender before making this amendment to the human rights law. We hope the committee will consult with additional advocacy groups, particularly in the transgender and gender nonconforming communities in that process. The NYCLU would also welcome the opportunity to work with the committee on this important piece of legislation to achieve our shared goal of providing comprehensive civil rights protections for all New Yorkers. Thank you so much. Thank you. I guess you got us looking now. I'm going <laughs> to turn this over to Mr. Drum, my colleague. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming in and for giving testimony. Thank you. Um, I'm not exactly sure, um, but why do you think it goes too far? Don't you think anybody should be protected from uh, discrimination for, uh, and not be able to be fired from their job um, except for job performance? I, I'm not exactly, when you say too far, what do you mean by the law goes too far? So as written in the amendment, the law now extends protections to potentially any relationship one has. So it could be to one's best friend or their grandmother. Um, and in doing so, in expanding the definition to include literally everyone, we're no longer protecting the marginalized community that the bill intends to protect. I'll 
also, if I, if I may, to be, sure. to be clear, Councilmember Drum, um, we do endorse expanding uh, the definition, but through broader, more inclus inclusive terminology that we, we are willing to discuss. Sure. Um, so I, I mean, I'm just trying to get at, because I think sure. that the term, this is what I was looking for, uh, the term sexual intuition means actual perceived sexual, physical, emotional, or romantic attraction or attachment or the lack thereof. So what, what is, I don't understand the objection to those words. So our objection, we, we haven't crafted uh, alternate um, legislation that we are prepared to present. We have discussed it within our office. Um, we don't take uh, issue with, with the term physical, romantic, um, or potentially, what, what was the third? Besides uh, sexual, physical, emotional, or romantic attraction. So sexual, physical, and romantic make sense. Um, emotional. Emotional is what expands the law to include potentially so if you anyone. Took emotional so emotional out. You, right. So you if you're talking about mo like your mom, you have an emotional attachment to potentially your mother, um, and so in broadening the definition, it's taking away that bill's power, this law's power, to protect the LGBTQ community specifically. So what about protections What about protections for those who are asexual? That would absolutely be included in the law. And, and I but might Isn't that mostly based on the emotional? Well, um, asexual community has a range of attachments and emotions. Um, absolutely, emotional connections are, are something that is talked about in the asexual community um, insofar as the spe community-specific terminology. Um, however, while that is true and may have a specific meaning within the asexual community, translating it to legislation without further clarification uh, does open it to a very broad interpretation. Um, as you know, the the law still very rarely uh, so it's just, makes it's it. It's hard for me to understand why you would oppose the legislation based on basically one word. That's not all we're opposing the legislation on, respectively. So, council, council what? Council so what, so, so a few, a few clauses, yes. Operative status. Oper so operative sex. status. Let's go to operative status, right? Sure. As for your opposition to the inclusion of operative status, do you not see instances where transgender individuals would be discriminated against because they may or may not have undergone surgery? Right. So I think that the our. I think that the, the intent in operative status is a good intent. I think that after talking to advocates and um, different folks who work in these issues, it is the intent is correct. However, the way it's specifically written in the bill makes it look like operative status is a proxy or at least part of defining gender. So it says operative status, and I don't have the, the text in front of me, I apologize. Um, does, does somebody have the proposed? Yeah, I could read it to you. The term gender shall include actual perceived or purported sex and shall also include, uh, and we, by the way, we, 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 are, we are working on the word purported as well. Um, uh, also include a person's gender identity, self-image, appearance, physical characteristics, operative, operative status, behavior, or expression. Right. So it should not be based on operative uh, status. Well, but the the term or post. Right. Or, so or even no decision at all. So the definition says gender may include, and then it goes on to include operative status in that definition. If we are to believe that all of those things. Uh, are important to determining one's gender, it, it uh, opens up the opportunity to exclude people based on their operative status. By including it as part of the definition, it thereby becomes a tool for discrimination. Uh, I think that it is, it does make sense and it is very important to put operative status um, in an exclusionary clause. So saying, I, I believe the next clause says, regardless of operative status. And I think that's important to include. Um, or, or just a broad terminology that does not touch operative status because it doesn't need to because it has broad applicability. Um, I just think that operative status in the NYCLU believes that operative status should not be part of the definition of gender. Um, often when we're evaluating legislation uh, in our litig litigation, um, we will look to the the ways that a law defines something. and balance those, those different ways to determine how we can get at what we want to get at. So if we looked to that law to say, how can we assert someone's gender in this circumstance, we might have a problem with operative status if our client 
had not chosen to have gender confirmation surgery, for instance. And that's a tool that could then thereby be, be wielded against us um, by a, a less well-meaning uh, litigator. Mm -hmm. So it's more the placement of the word than it is with the inclusion of the word? Yes, so especially in the first clause. Okay, so we, we can work on that. We, yes, yeah. I mean, we have, a, we have you know, right. okay. I don't have the time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so, so no, just, I thought at the end that you're in opposition to the legislation, but I guess you're saying in opposition to the way that it, those words are included or where they're included. Yes, so yeah. I, I know it's not technically a term, but we would probably couch it as qualified opposition. We are definitely in favor of the spirit of the legislation. Um, what we would like to do is work to really hone the text so that it is addressing exactly what we want it to address and you want it to address as well. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, indeed, there's a misconception that transgender people are not real. The purported sex, so you feel that should come out as saying that even if they are, if someone got a half done, they are not truthful. That's what this is really saying that you should take it out? You're referring to the word purported? Yeah. What do you mean by half? Because it's saying, um, it's like falsely saying that um, the identity, that the person didn't get in a full transition. So the, uh, this isn't specifically speaking to transition as far as you, I, I believe you're referring to like gender confirmation yeah. surgery specifically. As so a that's, real man or real woman. Right, so regardless of Op operative status, as we were talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Transgender individuals face accusations that they are not real men or real women. So when we talk about um, transgender individuals using public restrooms, people are saying, well, we don't want a, a man in the women's restroom. Well, there's not a man in the women's restroom. There's a woman in the women's restroom. Um, and so when, we're afford when we hear the word purported sex, um, that has the connotation of claiming or appearing to claim that it is a false representation of one's identity when really it is a genuine expression of one's identity. Okay. I, I think we're good with taking the word purported out too. So Great. Strike, one, strike <laughs> a victory there. Yeah. That's a victory. Okay. <laughs> then. All right. Any other questions? One, thank you for your testimony. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. All right. Without further ado. Um, you want to, you have any closing statements? I'll give it My to you. My only closing statement is thank you, Chair Mealy, for this wonderful hearing and always for your commitment to human and civil rights. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, and this hearing is now closed. Thank you.